Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My special guest on the show today is community organiser and anti-nuclear activist Marion Pack. Nuclear power was the issue that first moved Marion into action when a nuclear power plant was being built five miles from her home in northeastern Ohio. She and her family moved to Orange County, California in 1981, and at that time Units 2 and 3 of the San Onofre nuclear reactors were under construction. She became involved with the Alliance for Survival, the largest anti-nuclear organisation in Southern California, working to prevent the licensing of San Onofre. In 1986, she became the Executive Director of the Orange County Alliance for Survival, working on a broad range of issues related to nuclear power and nuclear weapons. In recent years, Marion Pack has applied her organising talents to issues like stopping the airport at El Toro, light rail for Orange County, voter registration projects, and democratic campaigns. Marion Pack, welcome to If You Love This Planet. Thank you so much, Helen. Well, you've had quite a career. Let's go back to when you first started. What, 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 what moved you to become an activist? Um, give us a little bit of an outline of, of your life, Marion. Sure. Uh, it really started with uh, my two daughters, uh, that were both in elementary school, brought some material home from school about how to protect yourself from radiation and how to build a bomb shelter. Oh, God. The material had been printed in the 1950s in the duck and cover era. And I knew a little bit about the nuclear power plant that was being built, but when I saw this literature that, it's like, hey, my utility company is building a power plant and I'm supposed to build a bomb shelter? Oh, really? It was related to the power plant? Yeah. Else, yeah, else. it was about the power plant and about radiation. Yeah. And uh, so that definitely pushed my buttons. I started going to city council meetings. I contacted um, Sun, the Sunflower Alliance, which was organizing around David Bessie. David Bessie uh, Nuclear Power Plant is about 30 miles to the east, or excuse me, to the west of Cleveland, and Perry is about 30 miles to the east of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I contacted the Sunflower Alliance and said, can't you do something about this power plant they're building? And, and they said to me, well, we kind of have our hands full over there. What we need is some local people to begin organizing over around your area. Mm. And so I'd never really done anything like this before, but I said, have other people contacted you? And they said, oh, yeah. I said, well, could you give me some phone numbers and I'll call them. So um, I called a number of people up and we met in my home. And we very quickly formed a group called the Evergreen Alliance. And uh, so there were a number of other things really that pushed my butt. I also had a friend that worked out there at the Perry Nuclear Power Plant, and he was a welder. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me what I considered real horror stories in that he said all the welds had to be photographed and documented. But when they found flaws in the weld, they were doctoring the photographs. Oh, my God, not doctoring the welds, doctoring the photographs. Yeah. That's what and happened went, uh, with Karen Silkwood, you know. She was a whistleblower. Um, uh, I can't remember where it was, but she, they were making fuel rods with plutonium in them and photographing them, and the abnormalities in the fuel rods, they were doctoring the photographs, not the rods. And she was mm -hmm. driving uh, with the documentation uh, in the back seat of a car to meet a New York Times reporter when she was killed on the way and when they got to the car, the documents were missing. So um, I'm not saying it's similar at all, but that they do tend to doctor photographs and not the actual abnormalities. Yeah, well, I heard it firsthand, and I said to my friend who worked there, I said, Wally, that power plant is as close to your house as it is to my house. I said, aren't you concerned? He said, well, they pay the best money. Oh, my God. And so that was kind of his response, you know, to the whole thing. Uh, I think for the first book I read on nuclear power when I started getting into this, in fact, was your book, Nuclear Madness. 
Yeah. And that was a great primer for what became my full-time career. And, so and you're so, certainly part of it. So, Marion, were you able to influence the Perry Power Plant, or did it get built and licensed and operate? Uh, it. I call it a 50% success. Mm -hmm. They had one of the reactors so far along that they did complete that one, and that one went online. The other one was only partially completed, and it was never finished due to cost overruns and also uh, a big public outcry about it. Mm. And we were doing things like when it was still politically correct to release balloons, and we released balloons from Perry that had little messages in it. If this, uh, if this message and this balloon reaches you, so could radiation from Perry Nuclear Power Plant. And we got phone calls from people in Canada. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So... That was uh, so. When I left, well, wait a minute. Ohio, don't, go, don't go on yet. Tell us about the history of Davis Bessie Power Plant, which was uh, fifty miles to the west of you, or thirty miles. Tell us about yeah, that power plant. Yeah, it was plant, one of Marion. It was one of the earlier plants, uh, or let's say one of the earliest plants to go online. And like so many, it was just riddled with problems, and down more than it was running. And uh, they have still kept it going, and right now I believe there's a whole issue with David Bessie and some safety violations. Isn't so that the one like where they where they uh, found a huge hole in the containment vessel that had eroded through the size of a football? Is that not David Bessie? I think that that might be it. The yeah. cap. I remember them talking about the cap had eroded. Yes, they they use boric acid as the cool in the coolant to because it moderates the flux of neutrons, and there was mm -hmm. a leak um, over the top of the of the metal containment, and the and the lid of the containment was about six inches thick of steel, and the boric acid over time had eroded right through, right through that six inches, and I think there are about two centimeters or two millimeters. I can't remember exactly of metal left between that and the pressure, huge pressure inside the vessel where the nuclear reactor was. And because the NRC had not insisted on routine inspections and there had been a lot of ill-advised uh, activities, um, there was almost, you know, a meltdown there and a major accident. So... That I th I'm sure it was Davis Bessie, but anyway, so Mary, I believe you're correct on that. Yeah, go on from there, please, from where you were just about to uh, leave off. Then, okay. Well, I was not there until you know for the whole time until Unit One was or not. Well, I don't know what they called them, Unit One or Two, but anyway, until the one unit was uh, abandoned as far as completion. Mm -hmm. you know, so we felt that we did have, you know, like I called it a 50% success. There was only one reactor there running to cause problems to melt down, to uh, release radiation and all those nasty things, uh, create radioactive waste that power plants do. So 50% win on that one. Then what did you do? Um, I moved to California in 1981, and almost from day one of arriving here, well, on the way, we passed Perry Nuc or, excuse me, San Onofre Nuclear Power Plant, and I had never seen a nuclear power plant like that because all the traditional ones I had seen have the cooling towers. Yeah. And this was just two big domes and then a bunch of equipment and buildings around it, but no cooling towers. So I quickly found out it was because it was ocean water cooled rather than having uh, cooling towers. Mm -hmm. and it's a one-pass system, and actually, well, there's another issue about a two-pass system that they are supposed to put in, but that's, that's, that's kind of jumping ahead of myself. So um, on my second day here in California, some friends took me to Laguna Beach, telling me what a beautiful community it was, and it is. In fact, that's where I live now. Uh, but there were people standing on the main beach that had signs that said, Stop the Arms Race. Shut down San Onofre and Alliance for Survival. Oh. <laughs> and my friends, almost, my friends and husband almost had to hold me down. I was ready to jump out the car and go join them. But uh, and they said, no, 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 we're just down here for fun right now. And But it did give me the name Alliance for Survival, and so I knew who to get in touch with. 
And probably it was only a couple weeks after that, there was a Walk for Peace in Venice, California, Mm -hmm. being organized by the Alliance for Survival. So I thought, well, I can go up there and maybe find out about people with the Alliance for Survival in my area. So that's what my husband and I did, talked to a number of people there, and I was given the name of Jeannie Bernstein. Lovely Jeannie. Yes, you remember Jeannie. Yes, is she still alive? No, she passed in October. And the, what was her husband's name? He was a lovely man too. I can't Did you remember. Know Peter? Yeah, I I stayed with them at Laguna Beach. Oh, Peter Peter Carr. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I did not have the pleasure of meeting Peter. He died six months before I arrived in California. Yeah. Oh dear. Okay. So and I would have loved to know him. I know. I know they're dear people. So then, so you joined, and then what happened to you, Marion? Yeah, I talked to Jeannie, and she told me where the Alliance for Survival held their meetings. And that was up at Chapman University, and so I went to my first Alliance for Survival meeting shortly thereafter, and they were in the process of setting up an actual office. And so I kind of joined in helping them move and all of that. And uh, Tim Carpenter, who I'm sure you know and remember, uh, at that point was one of the directors as well as Ellie Cohen was Mm -hmm. the other one. Mm -hmm. And so I started working with Tim and Ellie. I asked my husband, I said, do you think I can quit my job? I was working at that point at Robinson May, and I really wanted to get out of there. The best part of my day was when I could take my name badge off and grab my clipboards and go out into the mall and gather signatures for the Nuclear Freeze Initiative. (laughs) You sound like me, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that was the, the big thing going on then, was getting enough signatures to qualify it for the ballot. And, oh, uh, that was so, Prop 15, right? Right? No, this was nuclear freeze. Oh, and, oh, the nuclear freeze. Oh, yes. Yeah, we yes. had it on the ballot in 82. Yes. I okay. The proposition so, so what was happened? Before I got here. So what happened? Did you get it on the ballot? Yeah, we got it on the ballot and it passed in California. Ah. And then I took my first trip, trip to Washington after that when we went to lobby on it because their goal was, of course, having the Senate take a look at what people all across the country, because I believe 10 states passed it, and then all kinds of municipalities, and my little town of Laguna Beach here passed it and uh, considered themselves a nuclear-free city. Well, so, um, I, I remember when the nuclear freeze passed the House, um, and, it was, and, and I worked with Ed Markey on that, and in fact, the first vote lot we lost and I remember talking to Ed Markey uh, congressman Ed, Ma- Ed Markey at about midnight Markey, and yeah. he and I were weeping on the phone together and then later it was passed but it was a sense of the house it wasn't a real law they did pass it but it, but it really didn't mm-hmm. have an impact on nuclear weapons and the nuclear weapons build up um, yeah it didn't have the teeth it needed no it was like a feel good, okay, we've done this, we've said this, and this is how we feel, but we don't know if we aren't really going to do anything about Except it. Except that the nuclear weapons freeze, Marion, uh, I'm sure did help to bring about the end of the Cold War and that the physicians for social responsibility and the other doctors all around the world that we recruited and organised, they got to Gorbachev and he heard us describe the medical effects of nuclear war and he virtually said that's why he allowed the Cold War to end and the Berlin Wall to come down because he really understood the medical implications of a nuclear war. So that was a good thing, but in fact the weapons are still in place. So we really, through the retrospectoscope, I think have achieved nothing because you know we could have a nuclear war tonight by computer error or someone hacking into the early warning system and the like. So we kind of, that's where we stand. Anyway, after the nuclear weapons freeze and, you know, George the first got elected and the, and the like, what did you do then, Marion? Well, at that point, we were really pushing for a nuclear test ban on all testing. Yep. Nuclear testing, of course, had gone, on, had gone underground, but it was still going on actively. And so I made many trips out to the Nevada nuclear test site. I took groups of people from the Alliance for Survival. We had campouts out there. Um, I believe I was arrested at least, I don't know, five, six, seven times. Wow, wow. 
during the time we were out there. One time we got trucked all the way to Tonopah, which is in the north part of Nevada, and we were stuck there in jail for about seven days before we got out. Goodness. I, so, hope, uh, I hope you didn't breathe while you are at the test site because it's terribly radioactive. Uh, yeah, well, I think we did have to breathe, and we, were, we weren't we were deep into the test site. We were at Mercury. Um, I had a, one bad experience with their security people there on one of the actions. Um, what happened? Four, well, four of us women went across the fence. We didn't go to the main gate. Mm. Uh, oftentimes, the actions were blocking the main gate, and we were beginning to feel, okay, we've done that before. We want to do something else. And there were people that were also headed towards the interior, towards uh, Mercury. So we went over the fence, and we started walking towards where Mercury would be. And all of a sudden, this um, Jeep kind of vehicle pulls up with two guys in uniforms on, on. And they get out and said, what are you doing out here? What are you doing out here? Lay down on the ground. And they both screamed at us and to lay down in the desert floor with the cactuses and everything. And uh, then one told the other one, one was kind of like the superior, and he was bossing the other one. He said, search him, search him. And the guy kind of looked at him like, mm, these people don't carry weapons. Search him. I said, search him. And so then he also joined in and kind of uh, searching in places where they shouldn't be putting their hands. And I was livid. I was just outraged by the whole thing. And uh, when we, this was another trip where we were taken to Tonopah, and when we were released up there, I immediately headed into the sheriff's department to tell them about the security people and what we had experienced, and I'm afraid I didn't get um, much help from them. You know, it was more or less, well, you guys were out there, but to be told that you were searched because they thought I might be, we might be carrying weapons, it's like, oh, come on. So that wasn't a whole lot of fun. I did file a complaint also with my congress member, and the information that came back basically said that since we were trespassing and, uh, you know, they had the perfect right to search us for weapons. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's let's move on from there, Marion. Um, what happened to the test ban treaty was never ratified by the Senate. Is that right? I thought it was. The complete test ban treaty was ratified by the Senate. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, um, I know it was passed by both houses. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm wrong. Whether Everyone it Google ratified. it and see if it was or not. Okay, so you did. You worked on the test it ban treaty. They did stop the testing. They did stop the yeah, they, well, they, uh, testing yes, at they that did. point. Yes, they did. They stopped all testing above and below ground. So then what yeah, did you then do? Then they started computer modeling. Yeah, they started computer modeling and did virtual testing. That's right. And I've written right. about that in my book, The New Nuclear Danger, spending huge amounts of money on huge computer modeling and the like. So then, Marion, what did you do? Oh, well, there were certainly times where we, we kept an eye on what was going on at San Onofre. Mm -hmm. But once the re reactors had gone online and began functioning, some of the action around that did fall off. And a lot of it was because at that point the threat of nuclear war became greater than the threat of an accident at San Onofre. So a lot of us that were working on San Onofre before you know, became very actively involved in the whole nuclear weapons issue. And uh, so that's kind of where I stayed focused through... Well, I think in 1990 was when Ward Valley started. Ward Valley was the location right out by the Colorado River that the state of California wanted to build a low-level low, low level radioactive waste dump and put radioactive waste in unlined trenches next to the Colorado River. Yeah, very good idea. Yeah, <laughs> right. And also an area that was considered sacred to five Indian tribes in the neighborhood. Yep of uh, where they wanted to build that. So we kind of joined. It was Alliance for Survival. It was Banway's Coalition. It was Greenpeace. It was the five tribes. And we all banded together to fight that, that uh, radioactive waste dump. And you won. And we won. How long did it yep. take? How many years? Ten. See, you're, you're a really good example of, of what can be done. You, you're really outstanding, Marion. Okay, so you won Ward Valley. Then what? 
Well, we won Ward Valley, and that was the point in time where it became very hard to raise money on nuclear issues, yes. where back in the 80s, you know, everyone was concerned. They felt that most people would say, if you ask them, you know, could a nuclear war happen within the next 24 hours, they would say absolutely. And it still could. That's what people don't yeah, understand. Yeah, I know. But as far as people's thinking, yes. once the wall came down, the Cold War ended, yeah. the Soviet Union broke up, everybody thought everything is all well and good and we don't have to worry about it. And America kept its weapons on hair trigger alert and therefore so did Russia. And uh, it occurred to me as we've been speaking, Marion, you know, you should know, everyone should know that all the nuclear reactors, 104 of them in America, are targeted by at least one nuclear weapon from Russia. And so um, you can't even have a conventional war now in countries that are loaded with reactors because if the Second World War, for instance, was fought today in Europe, uh, Europe would be uninhabitable for the rest of time because all their reactors would have been targeted and melted down. So there's an integral association between nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants, not the least that you can make bombs from nuclear reactors, but that, you know, they one, one nuclear weapon dropping on a nuclear reactor would perman, permanently contaminate an area the size of Pennsylvania. Um, no, I think it's bigger than yeah. that. There was an article in Scientific American about that. Anyway, so, yeah, people lost interest. It was hard to raise yeah, money. Yeah, people lost interest. Yeah. I was having a very hard time raising money to keep the office open. Right. I had somebody who was sharing the office space with me. He produced uh, new, uh, newsletters for nonprofit organizations. Mm. And he moved his operation, and then I just could not keep the Alliance for Survival going on at that location. Yeah. I tried working out of my home for a while. That was really difficult. And then I did find a much less expensive office, and I kept things going. A uh, number of military bases in the United States closed, again, after the, the end of the Cold War and all of that. And uh, so our, it was a little bit about 1998, I believe, that uh, the El Toro Marine Base here in Orange County closed, and the county officials immediately wanted to turn it into a large commercial airport. So um, people, particularly in the South County, were just outraged. We have one airport here already. In fact, we have more airports within a 50-mile radius than probably anywhere else. And you have military airports. Does. Yep. Got lots of airports. And so people really fought hard. Everything crossed. You know, there was no partisanship in this one. It crossed all lines of people mm. being involved. And it was one of the last, I would say, volunteer initiatives that was passed in California. Well, in Orange, without, by that I mean not having paid petitioners. Mm. You know, it was done solely by the citizens, which I believe is what an, an initiative is all about. It's a way for a people, the people to have a say in something they want to change when they can't get the legislators to do it. Using their democracy. I'm interviewing yeah. Marion Pack, who's a community organiser, obviously, an anti-nuclear activist. Well, I want to cut to the chase now, Marion, and I want you to start sure. talking about when you got involved with San Onofre and what's been going on. The audience needs to hear this now. And why yeah. is it a danger and what are the problems associated with it? Let's get right into San Onofre. When did you get involved and why? Well, it was back in 1981 when I got involved when they were finishing Unit 3 and getting ready to license Unit 2 and Unit 3. There was one other reactor that had been online since 1968. It was one of the oldest reactors in the country, and it has since been closed and, and decommissioned. Okay. As, as much as they can call it decommissioned. Um, but it, too, had... It was just one thing after another as far as safety problems and uh, workers being intimidated. We had a whistleblower come to us in about that time period and wanted a welder and came forward with his testimony on, you know, what he had found and what, you know, he thought the problems were down there. So it was a very active time uh, when we still thought we might be able to stop the license. Well, you didn't, so but but let's talk about didn't. current the current situation now. You've been involved yeah. very deeply with what the last four years with the San Onofre issue, or how well, long now? Well, actually, actually not. 
I got involved again last summer. I had been traveling when Fukushima happened. My, I've been very lucky with the work I have being on campaigns because it's allowed me a chunk of time to travel afterwards. So I was out of the country when Fukushima happened. And that really brought things back into focus again. And I had a friend, um, Mel Kernahan, who was emailing me and said, Marion, you got to get back here. We need you. We need your help. I'm working with a small group, and, and we really need more people involved. And I said, okay, when I get back. So almost as soon as I arrived back, I contacted Mel, and uh, then I started going to meetings at San Clemente Green, was holding. That was kind of the main organized organization. There's actually three kind of that are involved. Mm. But uh, San Clemente Green had been a sustainability organization. They'd helped the city of San Clemente develop a sustainability plan for um, San Clemente. And that was really, you know, they were community gardeners and things like that. And then they had two people that were whistleblowers that came to them and said, you know, we ha- we're having real problems down there. We are afraid to go public. We'd like to know if you can release this information for us. And so that was kind of a turning point. And Gary Hedrick, he's, he's the founder of the organization, he was quite, a, quite naive at that point. And he said, oh, don't worry. We'll just contact the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and we'll get the info. <laughs> they'll get it fixed and it'll be no problem. <laughs> How naive, yes. <laughs> And then he found out, you know, after talking to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they'd ignore him, and they wouldn't call him back, and and all of that. And it was somewhere around that time then that Fukushima happened. So that really, as I said, uh, moved things to the boiling point. There was a NRC Nuclear Regulatory Commission meeting just about two weeks after Fukushima happened. And it was not going to be about Fukushima or any of that. They had another agenda, but people just poured into this meeting saying, what are we going to do about this and what about San Onofre? And, you know, people were truly scared. As they rightfully should be. Sure. I mean, we have a nuclear power plant that sits right at the coast of the ocean on top of three active earthquake faults. Yep. It's just like... It's Why unbelievable, isn't power it? Power plant there. You know? Unbelievable. Makes no sense. <laughs> makes no sense. We'll be and and in. eight million, nearly eight million people live within what a fifty mile radius. Yeah, it's over eight million people that live within a fifty mile radius. Uh, I mean, the fifty mile radius goes all the way up to Los Angeles and all the way down to San Diego and all the way into the inland area uh, of Southern California. Here. It's a one so, of the whole of Los Angeles doesn't rise up and. And close the thing down by brute force. Well, that would be great. We have enough people that could do it, but people still have this notion that we need it. Oh, ridiculous. I mean, you know, it just drives me crazy. Why don't the Americans turn their blasted air conditioners off in the summer and sweat? You know, and, and sweating is a very good physiological mechanism to lower your body temperature. That's why we've got sweat glands. But we live in such a sort of sort of aura of, in, of, of entitlement where we think we can have any anything and everything we want. But the truth is you don't need that those reactors for your electricity needs, I believe, um, oh. and that they make, you know, probably $2 million a day by selling the electricity. That's what it's about. It's not about your needs at all. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it services a little over 1 million people. So yeah. that isn't even one-eighth of what lives in the immediate area. Yeah. It's not that it produces so much power, and a lot of that isn't even used. It's sold, like you said, it's sold outside of the actual area where we might be yeah. using it. Yeah, so, so everything they say is really a sham. So, okay, last night there was a meeting. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or members of it, mm-hmm. came out, um, and, and employees of the NRC have a public meeting uh, where you live, just near San Onofre, about San Onofre, because it's been experiencing some extraordinary difficulties later. We're not even talking right. about earthquakes now or anything like that. So tell us, Marion Pack, what the problems have been 
that have been experienced recently at those two reactors at San Onofre sitting on an earthquake zone. Um, and, and what did the NRC reveal last night and what was the mood of the meeting? Well, can I go back just a little bit yes, before yes, that? Yes, you, you can. Okay, because uh, there have been a number of things that have happened with San Onofre in the last six months or so. Well, one of was, well, they received what's called a chilling effect letter from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, really you know, saying you have employees that are uh, making complaints, and so there was a whole issue about their safety culture and the employees. And that what was place. it? What was the issue? That they were not that they were being threatened with losing their jobs if they spoke up about things that were going on there that they did not feel, um, you know, should be happening when you're dealing with a nuclear power plant. Like what things so, that were going on? Uh, well, they found out that a backup system had been turned off for five years that was the battery backup to the cooling system that was one of the things um you know there were you know employees just had some real concerns i don't have the specifics of what the concerns were just that they had taken them to the nrc and then this also came to light about the backup uh batteries for the cooling system Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then last fall, also, there was an ammonia leak down at the plant. They had to partially evacuate the plant. And uh, oh, and workers were being threatened. I know that at some yeah. reactors, um, whistleblowers, they, they, they get them psychiatric help. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're sent to a psychiatrist. So what, what San Clemente Green, they had been working very diligently with their city council to try to get the city council of San Clemente, to take a position Uh on San Onofre, particularly on the issue of relicensing and the storage of waste on site. Now, we have uh, 30 years of waste that has piled up there of irradiated fuel rods. I almost tripped and said the bad word. I hate the word spent because it's one of their little... (laughs) Radioactive fuel rods. And and how yeah. many how many tons of of radioactive waste, high level waste, is at those reactors in the cooling pools, Marion? There there's about one and a half tons. One and a half tons. And we, no, there's well, we more had, than that. There's more than I that. I had heard. There's a little dispute there. I had heard four thousand tons. It's four. They they remove thirty and that's tons what we a had year. Been using. They remove mm-hmm. thirty tons a year from each reactor. So it must be at least four thousand tons. So anyway, there's a lot there, and they are beginning to dry cast store some of it, which means after five years or so, it has cooled enough to where they can take it out of the cooling ponds, which is where they put them when it, they came out the reactor, and move them to dry cast storage, feeling that that is more stable for the long period of time, of course, the <laughs> millenniums that uh, it has to be protected from, you know, the environment has to be protected from it. And the cooling ponds also were very overfull, very crowded. And that right in there in itself is a, uh, is a safety hazard. Are those cooling pools on the roof of the reactor or are they below the reactor? Oh, they are not at San Onofre. They're not on the roof. They're on the side. On the side. And are those, are those reactors uh, GE reactors, Marion Pack, or not? Yes. The, are they GE Mark I, the same design as the Fukushima reactors? No, let me take that back. They're Westinghouse. Oh, they're Westinghouse. Okay. okay. They're Westinghouse. Okay, yeah. so there was a they worry... They are pressurized... Pressurized. Water reactors yeah. rather than the other one. So there was a worry from the whistleblowers and they were being threatened and not being able to reveal the truth. And the NRC yeah, had all... a hearing about that. And then there was an ammonia leak. And then didn't a man, a man fell into a, a yeah. cooling pool, a I radioactive to... pool of water? Mm-hmm. Well, that's happened fairly recently, only within the last couple of months. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, somebody did <clears> fall in. They were reaching for a piece of equipment and lost their balance and fell in. Fortunately, it was one, I guess, where they have removed the rods. And so the water was not as contaminated as it might have been. And, you know, the usual pet answer, oh, he was fine, a little internal 
radiation, but nothing to worry about and he'll be fine. Which is rot because, you know, you only need, you know, a couple of atoms of radioactive material lodging in your liver or your bone or wherever and to mutate some genes in a cell to induce cancer. So there's no safe level. And when you get radioactive elements inside, anything can happen. You just don't know. Yeah. So last fall in our efforts to move the city council, they did find they did agree to hold two meetings. One of them was going to be with Edison and with emergency planners, and then the other was going to be with, let's say, our experts that have a different position on nuclear power in San Onofre. And so there were two separate public meetings. Both of them were attended by about 300 people. Mm-hmm. And coming out of that, the city council did pass a resolution. You know, they they were quite moved by the information they heard. In fact, you were on, on Skype during yes. the second one. Yes, I was, yep. Right, and so after that, they passed their resolution calling for a closure of the plant if the waste could not be removed and no relicensing. Those were kind of That's the two... very good, very good. Yeah, that was the meaty things out of it. And yeah. they also... They sent letters to all the other cities in Orange County, asked them to join with them. Letters went to all our elected representatives, went to the president of the action that they had taken. And I, at that point, said, well, gee, we ought to get more cities passing resolutions like Mm, that. mm. So I went to my city, Laguna Beach, and knowing there we have a progressive majority and people that well, one of the city council members is, was very active with the Alliance for Survival, that guy was. So we had a lot of people that were fairly knowledgeable about the issue of nuclear power already, and we had two that were on the other side of the fence, but it ended up that we had a four-to-one vote. Even one of the conservatives moved over to our side and passed a similar resolution to what they passed in San Clemente. Excellent. You know, I, I would interrupt here and say that this is a very conservative issue because um, we're for conserving life and preventing cancers and genetic abnormalities in children. Therefore, um, all conservatives um, of every stripe should support no no nuclear yeah. power. Yep. Well, I think the word conservative is kind of misused. Well, let's because... use the proper English <laughs> language, the Queen's yeah. English. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, we got a four-to-one vote there, Excellent. and then I took it over. I took the same... Uh, you know, kind of tacked with the Irvine City Council, except there I knew Larry Agron, and again we had a three to two majority on the council. Uh, we had, I talked, Larry actually wanted to make a whole big campaign out of it, which we did. I mean, we, he dragged it out where we got, had people there for three different meetings, and it ended up a five to zero vote. Excellent. On, on the resolution there. So what, what difference so, do these town council resolutions make to the whole issue of San Onofre and closing it down? Will they have an impact at all, Marion? Well, I think that when you have elected officials that come together, that magnifies the voice of the public. Yes. Now, we need to get the voice louder, and if we can get a number of cities that have signed on to say, hey, we won't tolerate this, I believe that it, it it expands our reach on the whole issue. Okay, so and moving on from that, then yeah. there was a, 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 actually quite a major accident a couple of months ago at right. San Onofre. Uh, so why don't you describe that to the audience, Marion Pack? Well, in January, actually on January 31st, there was a rupture in one of the tubes within Unit the generator unit three. And, of course, it was the usual, oh, it was just a minute amount, oh, it's nothing to worry about. But then they came public with not only unit three, but unit two was showing an unusual amount of wear in the tubing. Of course, within within the uh, generator, you have the hot water, radioactive water coming out of the reactor you have it bypassing or a second pass on uncontaminated radioactive water, heating that to the boiling point, which then turns into steam, which then exits to the turbine and turns the turbine. 
And so you can't have anything, let's say, any direct connection between these two waters. One, one has to be totally closed from the other. But with the rupture of this tube, it allowed the radioactive water from the reactor to then infuse itself, go into the secondary water that is not supposed to be carrying any radioactivity. Now, the, the primary coolant that you just described is highly radioactive. And these steam generators, um, there are two for each reactor. And there are 10,000 tubes in tubes each of these. Oh, not generator. per reactor? No, per... For per, the generator. Yeah, per, so that there are a total of 20,000 tubes in each reactor because there are two generators with 10,000 tubes each. Correct. And the tubes are made of a sort of alloy of steel and they're very, very thin-walled so that the heat from the primary coolant, the thermal heat, can be passed very quickly through to the secondary coolant or the water which is not radioactive, when the, which then, as you described, turns into steam, which turns the turbine, which generates electricity. So these steam generators were just recently manufactured by Mitsubishi in Japan. They um, were. Yes. And, they, they, and were not, they were put... Okay. Go on, go on. You go on now. <laughs> uh, they were all put in within the last two years. One is barely a year old. And the reason why they were being replaced was because the generators that were in them ha that had been functioning since 1983 and 1984 when the two plants went online, had degraded to such an extent that they had, had, when they find tubes that are weakened, they would close them off so that the water could not circulate through them any longer. And they had closed off so many tubes in the old generators that they weren't able to get the full amount of power out of them anymore. Right. So, that's so these are they really, decided. really new generators, which oh, should last another 30 years. And, and so what's happened is that they've found many of the tubes to be extremely weak and extremely thin, and quite a few have actually ruptured. Right. Right. Oh, uh, well, I'm sure you know who Arnie Gunderson is. I'm very, very close to Arnie, and he frequently okay. <laughs> appears on this program, so we all love I, Arnie. I yes. thought probably so. Yes. Well, Arnie's first take on the on what had happened was absolutely correct. It seems that they were supposed to be, they, Edison, were supposed to exchange like for like. In other words, the old generators and the new generators were to be the same. Mm -hmm. But to put more, cool, more, uh, more tubes within the generators, they had removed a structure, a support structure, and then were able to put in over 300 more tubes into them. Why this did they want to put more tubes in? It increases the power output. They can make oh, more. Oh, they money. can make more steam. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and uh, so that's what Arnie thought it was, and that seems exactly pretty much. The, well, there's a little bit more that we know about the steam. When they took this out, they also increased the amount of steam or the uh, the flow of steam. I guess I should say they boosted it up. So that, again, there would be more energy, more power to turn the turbine. Yeah, they boosted the power output. I suppose they moved from 3% uh, enrichment of the uranium to 3.5 or 4%. That's what they do to boost the power output, make more steam. So there are two things going on. They boosted the power output, number one, and they put in 300 more tubes into each of the steam generators to make more steam, to make more money, as you just said, Yeah, Marion. And yes. took out an important part that kept those tubes stabilized. Which What, so what sort of part was that that stabilized the tubes? That I don't exactly know. Something that holds the tubes in place and to make room for these extra tubes they wanted to put in, yeah. they removed that and were able to put in extra amount of tubes. Uh, from what we know now from the meeting the other day, there's, Mitsubishi has never built any other generators like these. Mm. They are unique to themselves. Right. And so the whole question has now been asked in making this change when it was supposed to be like for like, was there supposed to have been a whole process, like a relicensing process, that should have gone on? And was the NRC really told about the changes that were being made? So that is still supposedly being investigated. 
the uh, now to the meeting. I guess we'll, we'll get to now. Well, was, um, what did Edison request these changes so it could make more money? Is that what happened? And yeah. then Mitsubishi did it, and then the NRC was not notified, so a new license with new equipment was not obtained. Eh? Right. 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 Okay. So what happened uh, at the cert- meeting? There's a certain amount of modifications, I guess, that they're allowed, but then when you go beyond a certain point, and they did definitely change the design. Yes. So this meeting that was held, uh, it was Mon- Tuesday evening. It was Tuesday evening, and so the, um, no, it was Monday evening. Take that back. I'm on Wednesday now. So Monday evening was the first report that was released about what have what they have found as far as problems, because both Units 1 and Units 2 have been closed since January 31st. Mm-hmm. And, of course, there has been plenty of scare tactics used, put out in the media about how there's going to be brownouts and there's going to be blackouts and how are we going to get through the summer. And, you know, us, on the other hand, are hoping that, well, just by getting through the summer, gives us a footing to stand on to say, do we really need these? Do we really need to take to run the risk of having these operate when we made it through a summer without them? But it's also so crazy because, look, like, if there's a if there's a meltdown <laughs> at one of those reactors, for God's sake, how can they? There's there's no comparison. Can you get through a summer without a nuclear power plant? Or do we have a nuclear power plant and millions of people, you know, dying later of cancer because there's been a major accident? And what happened was that these steam generators, because they didn't have the required support and the and the intervening plates between the tubes to stabilise them, because there was so much pressure and energy going through the tubes with the water at a higher temperature, the tubes vibrated and rubbed against yeah. each other and created yes. holes in the tubes and also tremendous thinning of the tubes themselves. So, therefore, right. they don't know how many tubes are at risk, number one. Number two, if the tubes did rupture, they could, I think, and, and a lot of radioactive water got out, they could lose their cooling system. Is that true, Marion Pack? Uh, yes, it, it certainly is. And uh, Arnie Gunderson... And his testimony said that he felt that we were within 24 hours of a cascading event. Oh, really? Oh, my that, God. Yeah, that was That's, what he, that's That should scare the bejesus out of everyone in Los Angeles. I mean... It, <laughs> it should, because what that means is one tube would rupture, that causing the next tube to rush, yeah. rupture, and the next one after that... And like a cascading, Cascade. like dominoes falling. Yeah. And so um, we are. We once again dodged the bullet, and they got it shut down in time. But you know, I would question there the way that you know how can you possibly thoroughly test thousands and thousands of tubes and know that the integrity is sufficient? They can't. To they function. can't, and they know that they can't, and they know many of them are very thin, and they know the design is faulty. And they know there's a there's a danger, and to replace them, what it co- would cost six hundred million, or how how much did yeah. it cost? Well, to, the to original buy those cost of them was six hundred and seventy one million dollars. Yeah, but it would be over a billion of... now to replace them, and um, and I don't think, and it's Commonwealth Edison who runs the thing. I don't think they can afford that, can they? Well. Of course, the ratepayers are paying for the first round of generators. Oh, good on them! Yeah, in. your poor old that rate was pays. all passed on to us. Yes, and there was something said about well by Edison that if we have to replace them, we will not charge the ratepayers for them. Whoopee! Well, okay. So you had a good meeting the other night, and and people oh, demonstrated. And there was an excellent article in the Los Angeles Times, I think, yesterday, which I've tweeted and Facebooked already, describing the abnormalities in those steam generators and what should be done, etc. So can you talk about the meeting? Well, first of all, it was very well attended. There were well over 300 people there. Good. And uh, I was kind of, I was surprised initially because oftentimes the NRC will take testimony but they don't answer questions 
where this was a meeting where they were trying to answer the public's questions. And so they, they're kind of uh, the PowerPoint that they did, uh, which is available on one of our websites now. You can get to the PowerPoint of what happened you know, as far as their presentation. And so that ran for about an hour and with also NRC and Edison both, and then some people that were on the team were all there, t- you know, talking about what had happened. Mm-hmm. And one of the thing, one of the new things that was brought out of at the meetings was that there may have been in, incorrect computer modeling. Mm. So this is one of the things where they can kind of say, well, it wasn't really our fault. It wasn't really our fault. The the modeling that was done when they were built by Mitsubishi <laughs> wasn't right. Whatever it is, whichever it was, it that doesn't let them off the hook with where we are right now. And the whole statement by Arnie about a cascading effect, it is just... <laughs> I asked a question uh, on Monday evening asking that, well, since you keep saying that what was released on January 31st was a very, very minute amount. And these generators are inside the containment domes. The containment domes are four to six foot of steel, concrete, and rebar. How did that little bit of radiation get out? Now, mind you, I knew the answer to it, but I wanted them to admit it. Mm -hmm. They said, well... When it ruptured, it it flowed into the non-contaminated water, which then flowed into the turbine, which is outside of the containment building, and that is how the radiation got out into the atmosphere. And I said, well, are you telling me then if we had, had a more severe accident with more radiation release, those containment domes wouldn't have done anything to protect the public from the radiation that was released? He said, yeah, I guess I'd have to say that. Oh, oh God. <laughs> what was, so the, right there, what was the reaction of the audience? Um, a lot of hard stares at them, like, what? I, I knew what I, I knew how it had happened, but I wanted them to say that the containment domes wouldn't contain this. So what are they going to do now, Marion? Well, they are going to continue their investigation. Um the Friends of the Earth has become very involved yes, in this. and David they Freeman, pres- too. Uh-huh, yes, David Freeman. Yeah. And so they have now filed a lawsuit that there should be a whole relicensing. No, you know, re- there shouldn't be a relicensing. They should so close the bloody that. thing down. I mean, <laughs> You and I frank. know that. It's such, yeah. such rhubarb, you know, relicensing, more laws. Rhubarb, the thing has to be closed down. It has to be closed down. Do you know, um, there's a man in charge of Greenpeace now. He's from Africa. I can't remember his name and I want to interview him. But the the situation at Rio Plus 20 at the moment, where they're all meeting now to discuss the fate of the earth virtually, um, and no one's willing to pass any laws to curb carbon emissions, to fix greenhouse warming, which is really almost out of control, past the tipping point he said the time for you know politeness and petitions and the like is over he said now it has to be civil disobedience this is war he said this is war and it really is it's war to save the earth and it's like rosa parks not standing up in the bus which initiated the whole civil rights movement and it was war in a way because people with their bodies stood up to the to the the people in control and they won and it's the only way now. I, I'm sick of being polite because it doesn't work. And I really totally agree with this Greenpeace guy who we must get on the show that it is war and it's war to save the planet and it's war to save our souls and war to save our bodies and war to save our children's lives and our fetuses and war to save all the organisms on the planet. I'm sorry I'm raving, but I'm beyond the point of no return now. And I think... I think Americans are terribly polite, and I think the time for being polite is over. I think indignation is appropriate, passion is appropriate, um, and along with that comes joy, of course, but, you know, a sense of absolute certainty that I'm not going to take it any longer. 
And there was a film called Network and there was an Australian who played in that film and he got he was he was a, a broadcaster and I think he leant out the window and screamed, I'm not going to take it any longer. And that became part of the sort of Rubicon of the of the English language in a way. And I think that's the stage we must reach now, Marion Peck. I agree, Helen. I am a firm believer in nonviolent direct action to put your body on the line and yep. say, not in my name. Well, and you know, I Martin have... Luther King said, if you don't have something worth dying for, you're not really living. And I guess I've always felt like that. You know, I've had mm-hmm. eight death threats and I've run off the stage when people have stood up with funny looking lumps in their pockets and things. And, and I've wondered if, if a wooden podium would deflect bullets and the like. Um, and I was, you know, I, I had the same attitude because what's my life compared to, you know, <laughs> life on the planet, really? And I think with these nuclear power plants, which are just latent nuclear weapons sitting in the midst of all of us, um, I think that attitude is totally appropriate now. I'm, I'm beyond being polite, beyond. David Freeman no. says that you're you're a, a sort of highlight. You're the standard bearer, and that if if you close down the San Onofre reactors, that'll have ramifications and a cascading effect across the yeah, whole. Yeah, we country. want a good cascading effect. <laughs> <laughs> so, Marion Pack, um, I really wish you just with all my heart and soul the best of luck. Uh, we'll be standing with you. The whole audience will. I guess you probably need some money to keep going. Is there a place on your website to donate? I don't know. Oh, well, anyway. <laughs> you know, we're so weird about money. Well, you know, people they, can get they in put touch it so, with you. so important, and we put it, you know, like, well, yeah. I don't want to ask for money. But it is an important yeah. part of organizing, okay. and we've got to get better at that. Well, everyone take note and take Marion's examples as a perfect sort of person to emulate. I thank you very much, Marion, t- today for a fascinating uh, discussion, and, uh, and, and I wish you all the very best of luck in the future. Thank you, Helen, and good luck to us all because yeah. it's really us all it is. that are running the risk. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Helen. My guest today on If You Love This Planet was and is community organizer and anti-nuclear activist Marion Pack. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. Um, tell all your friends and relatives about this show so that we can get them all listening, so we can all learn and, and work together for a safe, safe planet for our children and our grandchildren. Uh, thanks for listening today. We'll be back with you next week. Bye for now.